And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. Welcome, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. It's great to be with you today as we're rocking and rolling through the week, learning how to explain, defend the faith with clarity and charity. Got a fantastic show in store for us because we're going to have Master Apologist William Albrecht come on the show, and we're going to talk about the ascension of Christ in Scripture and also in tradition and history. So uh, that's going to be a very interesting thing. As you know, William Albrecht has done a lot of research in the patristic roots of all sorts of Catholic doctrine and devotion. And uh, so he's he's one of those guys that is a research nerd, kind of like myself. And so it's always cool to have him on the show. And uh, that'll be coming up on the other side of the break. On this side of the break, we're going to do what we always do, our Finding the Fallacy. Today's Finding the Fallacy is the definitional retreat fallacy. And also, we're going to meet an early church father. Today's early church father is St. John Cassian. St. John Cassian. So, got lots of great stuff in store for us today. So, without further ado, I want to welcome all of you to the show, beginning with our live stream audience. Hi, everybody. And also all of you listening on radio around the country and also via podcast around the world, either through our handy dandy phone app or through our flagship website, which is virginmostpowerfulradio.org. And by the way, you need to stop by there to find out all the great stuff that's coming on, coming on board online and in uh, conferences as well. All of it's right there, virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Also, by the way, if you want to share this uh, program with people, tell people about it, that's also a great place to go because the, both VirginMostPowerfulRadio.org and the app, the uh, phone app, allows you to access our shows and also do all sorts of stuff with them. And so all you need to do is just go to VirginMostPowerfulRadio.org, scroll down to Hands on Apologetics, and bam, you got all the shows right there. You can download them, you can share them, you can tell people about them. And it's all great stuff. So uh, you can be part of our mission and also do apologetics and evangelism simply by clicking your mouse. I tell you, uh, defending the faith is easier than ever before. So there's no excuse, folks. No excuse. You can click your mouse. <laughs> you know, you could, you could dial up a phone app. I know you guys can do it. And uh, please do, because like I said... It furthers our mission. It furthers our mission to get Catholics out there, uh, light a fire underneath them, and also fortify them with great, great information. By the way, if you ever want to contact me, I'd love to hear from you. The official dojo mailbox is questions at handsonapologetics.com. That is questions at handsonapologetics.com. And uh, that comes directly to me, and I do answer your emails so uh love to hear from you and also love your feedback a couple of people that really enjoyed last week's program we had a, a couple of young ladies who are really really good apologists in their own right and uh you know gave lots of great hope for us i think uh just knowing that there are these people i run into them all the time because i teach homeschoolers and i have to tell you uh they are part of a larger group of youth that are incredibly articulate, well-educated, solid Catholics. And, uh, you know, it gives you hope for the future that they're out there. And uh, uh, one of them, one of the two guests, was suggested by you, the audience. So I want to thank you for that suggestion. And I want you to keep telling me your suggestions. If you know somebody out there on social media that's rocking and rolling, doing a great job defending the faith. Let me know about them. Send me the links to their work so I can check it out for myself. And then I'll contact them, and we'll see whether we can square it with their schedule because this is a live program, and a lot of people aren't available at this hour. 
So um, I'll do my best if they can do it. We'll have them on the show. And uh, that's a great opportunity for them to get more exposure, get experience, and uh, kind of um, give them a leg up in ministry. Because we're all on the same team, folks. We're on the team fighting for Christ and his church. And I think it's important for us to support each other in that endeavor. So, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Let's go to the Finding the Fallacy for today, which is the Definitional Retreat Fallacy. Um, definitional Retreat is uh, goes under many different names, including uh, Moving the Goalpost. And basically what it is, is as more and more evidence is being presented within argument, what happens is people begin to ter- change the terms of the argument. They start to retreat on their original position and start modifying it so it becomes more and more difficult to refute. And uh, this happens an awful lot, an awful lot. You can start, uh, you even see this in formal debates. They will start with an opening statement. And then by the end of the debate, the definitions and everything has been changed. Why? Because they want to avoid certain uncomfortable um, and obviously false things that were included in their original stance. So they'll redefine things as they go. So just like moving the goalpost, you, you know, thinking about the game of football, you move the goalpost, you know, the person will never be able to score because you, <laughs> you kick the ball and the goalposts move and they miss. The same thing's true in debate and dialogue is unless a a person sticks to the original definitions, you'll never be able to actually have a meaningful conversation. So what you need to do, and this is primary whenever defending the faith, listening is more important than speaking. You need to really hear what the person is arguing, what exactly is their position, ask questions, nail it down at the outset, so you know exactly what's being argued before you begin to uh, criticize it or analyze it or provide an alternative explanation. That way, if later on they try to redefine things, you can call them on it because you have a very clear understanding of their starting point. And remind them of that as well. Don't allow them to change the definition. Uh, unless they are willing to say that their original definition is wrong, and at least then you're making some progress, and then you could start working on the new redefined goal. And that is our finding the fallacy for today, definitional retreat. All right, let's meet our early church father for today, who is St. John Cassian. By the way, St. John Cassian is actually not a saint of the church's universal calendar, but he is reckoned and revered as a saint by a good many local churches in France. In spite of some evidence and arguments to the contrary, it remains most probable that Cassian was a native of southern Gaul, which is modern-day France. Uh, Bardenhauer, a uh, petrologist, remarks that uh, the suggestion that he came from Scythopolis in Palestine uh, is hard, hardly won many friends. In other words, most people believe he was born in southern France. As a youth, in the company of his older friend Germanius, uh, Cassian sojourned for a while in a monastery in Bethlehem. Later, about the year 385 AD, he pursued asceticism, which took him to Egypt, and where he spent seven years learning the science of asceticism from the monks and ascetics in monastics, uh, monasticism's homeland. A second time, he came to Egypt, spent another year in the deserts of Screte, which he later turned the habitant of the most perfect monks. Sojourning to, uh, or journeying to Constantinople, he was ordained to the diaconate by John Chrysostom himself. And in 405 AD, with Chrysostom, a second time in exile, Cassian, uh, still in the company of Germanus, came to Rome. But after this, we hear... Uh, of the faithful Germanus no more. 415 Cassian is now a priest. He founded two monasteries in Marseille, one uh, uh, one for men and the other for women. And there was, until the time of his death, about 20 years later, he ruled as uh, his monasteries as abbots. As abbot, excuse me. 
It was in these monasteries at Marseille and with Cassian as the father that semi-Pelagianism was born. Originally, the semi-Pelagians were called Marseillean, uh, Marseillians after their origin in Marseille. And if we fall into the very common error of regarding semi-Pelagianism as a kind of diluted Pelagianism, we'd never understand John Cassian as a semi-Pelagian he held no belief at all with the Pelagians. Uh, the latter he condemned roundly. He regarded Pelagianism as the mother of Nestorianism, in which he termed Pelagian the pupil and imitator, because the Pelagians taught that man could by his own efforts and without God's help achieve righteousness. Nestorianism taught that uh, the man, Jesus, <coughs> by virtue of his conduct of his life, came himself to deserve union with the divine majesty. If the latter notion seems uh, similar to a rather common idea in our own time, it, to the effect that Christ it can only gradually be realized th that he was God, <coughs> perhaps was not fully aware of it until he was hanging on the cross, this is the same as saying that his divinity was only gradually actualized and perhaps not fully actualized until the cross. Again, that harkens back to Nestorianism, which, by the way, is going well today. And that is our early church father for today, St. John Cassian. Coming up next, William Albright on the Ascension of the Lord. Here's a great way to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Do you have an old car you want to get rid of, motorcycle, RV, or boat? Simply call 855-500-7433, and when they sell that vehicle, a portion of that money comes right back to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio. It's an easy way to do it. I want to thank you for it. Call 855-500-7433. God love you and your family. Mom's going to have a baby? She is. Will it be a boy? Or will it be a girl? We don't know yet, but we heard the heartbeat, and my dad said this is going to be someone very special. You mean like being a president? Or maybe a doctor? Well, probably maybe like a singer or dancer, I think. Hello, my name is Mary Ann Koharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. We know that every baby is a miracle and has the potential to do great things. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please call 1-800-366-7773 or visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. Pro-Life Across America. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. And we're going to talk about the ascension of Christ and uh, its biblical background, its historical background, its importance in theology. Help us do that. We have our good friend, Master Apologist William Albrecht with us. As you know, William uh, has debated in over 50 live and moderated debates. He's a defender of the faith in the first rank. He's done amazing research. He's co-authored several books and has books on the way. 
And, okay, let's see if I can remember all the things, William, you do. Okay, so you're, you're a co-host occasionally on Reason and Theology. You have your own channel, William Albrecht Channel, and a fantastic website called patristicpillars.com. And, of course, William is my, um, I guess, uh, co-founder of Apocrypha Apocalypse on YouTube as well. So, William, welcome back to Hands-On Apologetics. Gary, thrilled to be here with you. And yes, you're definitely right. There is a lot that I do It's because this really is my passion. I love um, talking about all things theology related, related to our wonderful, amazing Catholic faith. And today is, is, is a very fun and interesting topic as well in the sense that I, uh, in thinking about something to talk about, Gary, I realized you don't really hear a whole lot about the ascension of Christ into heaven. It's a feast day. We have it in scripture. We do talk about it occasionally, but we don't really dive into what the Bible really does say, what the fathers say, and maybe even tackle perhaps objections as well to the historicity of the event. And I think it's really important to talk about it. As you know very well, this month we do celebrate that feast day. That's right. Yeah, and in many ways, the, the feast of the ascension is kind of one of those forgotten feasts, I think. A uh, very, very important uh, part of Christ's uh, earthly ministry. And uh, I think that's largely because us Catholics, we've forgotten the importance. We've forgotten the, you know, the biblical and historical background to it. Yeah, we really kind of have, Gary. And it, it really is very important. Now, we put a lot of emphasis on the, on the death of Christ and the cross, the crucifixion, uh, and the bodily resurrection. And rightly so, that we do put a lot of emphasis on all of that. But connected with all of that is the incredible truth that our Lord and Savior bodily ascended into heaven as well. Indeed, you have uh, this come up very often in discussions that are related to the bodily resurrection. We just finished celebrating that amazing festival of Easter. And I, I think it's really important to dialogue and to talk about, okay, well, what do we mean by the bodily ascension? Do we mean that Christ elevated himself into the clouds? Heaven is literally up there. What does the church mean by the ascension? And I think that once we begin to unwrap everything, including looking at the writings of the very first followers of the faith, the early church fathers, I think we get a really clear picture, Gary, and I think it's very, very important that we talk about it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, absolutely. I, everything Christ does reveals something about yeah. himself and something about the Father. And therefore, it's so important for us to understand the life of Christ, what he said and did. And especially when the church elevates it to the level of a feast, you know, yeah. the church is really putting its finger saying, this is important. Without a doubt. And, and I really like looking at what the New Catholic Encyclopedia says, Gary, it, it really lays it out wonderfully when it notes that, what is the ascension? Well, it's the elevation of Christ into heaven by his own power in the presence of his disciples the 40th day after his resurrection. We find it narrated in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 16, verse 19, St. Luke, twenty four fifty one, and the very first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. So we go on to read that, not only is the fact of the ascension related in the passages of Scripture, but it is also elsewhere predicted and spoken of as an established fact. Thus, in John chapter 6, Christ asked the Jews, If then you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, and then he notes also in 20, uh, verse, chapter 20, verse 17, where he says to Mary Magdalene, Do not touch me, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. So we've got very clear language used by the evangelists. We have an early festival. And indeed, in a moment, we'll look that we even have Old Testament allusions that point to the bodily ascension. Now, we want to draw a distinction, Gary. Now, I know... Uh, people of evangelical faiths tend to get confused. Maybe even Catholics might get confused and might think, oh, well, don't we also have a festival of the Ascension of Mary? No, we don't. We have an Assumption of Mary. Now, what is the difference? In the Bible, it is recognized that only God and God alone can bodily ascend into the heavens, can ascend and can descend by his own will and power. 
the great saints, such as St. Mary, Enoch, and Elijah, can be assumed into heaven or translated. That is done by God. They do not do it by their own power. Only God has the power to ride the clouds as the books of the Old Testament clearly lay out. And I think, Gary, that's really important because if we realize the theology behind all of this, the ascension into heaven, well, wow, it really does give us a fuller picture into the role of our Lord and Savior, that role of being almighty incarnate God. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I never thought of uh, Enoch and Elijah as being precursors to uh, the ascension. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah re really, really interesting. Amazing how, how everything in Holy Writ... Uh, you know, you've got foreshadowing. You've got um, yeah. he literally shadows, as the great St. Augustine calls them. And you even have clear allusions or prophecies, if you will, kind of very strong allusions in the Old Testament. In the book of Psalms, chapter 68, you clearly have it right there where it reads, You have ascended on high. <clears throat> you have led captivity captive. You have received gifts among men even from the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there, the Lord God might dwell on high. Now, this was quoted, Gary, in the book of Ephesians, where St. Paul links that very language of the Old Testament with the ascension of Christ. Ephesians 4, it says, this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean? except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. That theology we find there, Gary, in the book of Psalms is clearly fulfilled in Ephesians 4, chapter 8 to 10. Yes. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so uh, the ascension's rooted, you know, in Scripture and... Uh, and uh, you know it's really through scripture that we we truly uh can plummet steps as well so yeah great yeah w without a doubt gary and and i always try to to toss in if possible a deuterocanonical reference we also <laughs> have one we have a very powerful one so if you look in baruch baruch chapter three there was no doubt a hearkening to baruch in the new testament and indeed in baruch three we also read of the fact that it is only God who can go into the heavens. And we read, it is great and has no bounds. It is high and immeasurable. The giants were born there who were famous of old, great in stature, expert in war. God did not choose them or give them the way to knowledge. So they perished because they had no wisdom. They perished through their folly. Now, what do we read of the attributes of God? Who has gone up into heaven? and taken her and brought her down from the clouds. It's noting that only God can ascend into heaven. But Baruch 3, particularly verse 29, has an incredible parallel with the Gospel of St. John, chapter 3, verse 13, which reads, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. Now, who is that? That is the Son of Man. Wow. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I love uh, having you on the program because you always seem to find some deuterocanonical text that brings a bear on this. And yeah, really so incredible. go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of implications to that. Yeah, there really are, Gary, a, a lot of implications. And really, Gary, it is so incredible the way Scripture ties in. So we look at these clear allusions or or prophetic allusions, if you will, in the Old Testament come to fulfillment in the New Testament. So we have literal shadows of being told that it is God and God alone who does ascend. Now, we know very well in the book of Ruth, there are also those incredible prophecies of the incarnation. How fitting that we also have a very clear allusion to the fact, actually not a clear allusion, a very clear teaching that it is God and God alone who goes up into the heavens and in the Gospel of St. John, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. Very clear, Gary. What are we being told? The only one that has the power to ride the clouds, to go into heaven by, excuse me, by his own power, by his own will, is the God-man, our incarnate Lord, 
Jesus Christ. So those are very powerful Old Testament allusions. They're laying the groundwork, Old Testament, clear prophetical images. They lay the groundwork for what we're going to then encounter in the New Testament, Gary. And in a moment, we're going to see how we as Catholics, we have to be very clear. This is not a symbolic spiritual. And when we say spiritual, we mean uh, merely symbolic in the Western kind of mindset. It is not a merely symbolical kind of imagery being put forth in the Bible. It is a true historical event that really did happen. Our bodily risen Lord did bodily ascend into heaven. And I think that's the important thing we need to realize. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, William, if I'm not mistaken, I hear a future episode for the Apocrypha Apocalypse. In, in, in Without a doubt. Now, I, I got to say, Gary, I'm so thrilled that I'm, as you know very well, I, I was sick for several weeks, barely had a voice, had a cough. I'm thrilled to be back in the saddle, if you will. And we're going to be putting out some God willing, incredible material over there in the Apocrypha Apocalypse. I want to tell people, Look, we've got a lot of material on the book of Baruch where Gary has done stuff. I've done material as well. You got to go over there and check it out if you want more in depth stuff on Baruch. In particular, I love the incredible, this is relevant to the show, the incredible imagery and teaching of the incarnation in the book of Baruch. What an incredible Old Testament book, isn't it, Gary? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, you made a very important connection too, William, as you know, uh, with all your debating. Yeah, there, yeah. There is a stream of thought out there that wants to deny the bodily resurrection yep. and uh, totally spiritualize it. And that's, I think, in terms of apologetics, that's really where the ascension becomes very important because obviously the, the bodily ascension, you know, confirms the bodily resurrection. Without a doubt, Gary. And it then opens up the avenue to the the skeptics wondering, OK, well, do you mean is it dogmatic that Christ literally rose and heaven is in the clouds? No, it's not. What is dogmatic and what is biblical, what is truthful is the fact that he bodily ascended. They physically saw him rise. It doesn't mean that heaven is located in the clouds. It means they physically saw him rise with their limited eye, their limited senses. We don't know exactly where heaven is, though. Absolutely. We're chatting with William Albrecht, talking about the ascension of our Lord. More to come right after this. You're listening to Hands On Apologetics. Jesus said to the apostles in Luke chapter 10, Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. According to St. Boniface, in her voyage across the ocean of this world, the church is like a great ship being pounded by the waves of life's different stresses. Our duty is not to abandon ship, but to keep her on course. May our Lord help us remain ever faithful to his church to aid and defend her. This is a minute meditation from Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I am the bread of life. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it and not die. John chapter 6 verses 48 to 50. Saint Catherine of Siena once said, How sad it is when those who have food before them, let themselves die of hunger. Take your food, the loving Lord Jesus, who was crucified for us. Dear Heavenly Father, let us never go hungry for spiritual food. Help us to receive your Son often, in Holy Communion, so that we may be brought together with you, in the union of the Holy Spirit. This has been a Minute Meditation from Virgin Most Powerful Radio.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We're chatting with Willie. Oh, back talking about the ascension of our Lord. And, uh, yeah, some points right before the break, William, about the importance of the bodily resurrection, its connection to, uh, excuse me, the bodily ascension in, uh, that has connections to the bodily resurrection. And uh, also, uh, you know, that wonderful setup you gave with Baruch, and uh you know that only god can ascend to heaven yeah i think you you you're definitely correct there gary the, the the incredible connection with the bodily resurrection of our lord cannot be denied and you brought up how there is a, a kind of um within atheist apologetics if you will a kind of spiritualizing of the resurrection and of the ascension now when we say spiritualizing do we deny that there is spiritual no we don't because we rise and our Lord had a physical glorified body. That is what is meant by spiritual. So in that sense, we give a hearty amen to a, a spiritual resurrection and a spiritual ascension. But remember, we hear spiritual, Gary, and we tend to think of it in the modern day Western kind of sense of it being symbolic or immaterial. And that is not what we mean. And that's not what the Bible means either. We do want to make that very clear. And indeed, we look at the Gospel of St. Luke, Gary, it's very clear. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, in verse uh, chapter 24, and he blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Now, Remember what their limited finite senses were able to capture was that our Lord was carried up into the heavens in their very eyesight, in their eyes. He left from their sight. Does he remain with us today? Not physically, of course, in that sense. He is with us today in a very real spiritual sense in the Holy Eucharist. Now, again, when we say spiritual, we mean he is truly present. He's transubstantiated in the Eucharist. He is truly present. We believe in the real presence. We can say spiritual, again, without meaning an actual um, symbolic kind of interpretation. So now, with, now, and I know that gets into a whole other theology, so I recommend people look at shows we've done on transubstantiation. So again, their limited finite senses, Gary, were able to see the Lord ascend into heaven. Now, we don't know exactly where heaven is. He departed from them and he disappeared from their sight. The incredible thing that we do know, Gary, is this is recounted in more than one place in scripture. And Gary, it is meant to be taken in a literal fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you have multiple attestations to the ascension of Christ. Um, yeah. Again, that that points to um, that this is a, a real historical event as well. It, it really does. And, and I, I love the way you have a clear connection in the other in the Gospel of St. Mark as well. And, and then in, in the in the, um, the book of Acts. So in Acts, Gary, again, what the way this is laid out is so important that we have got to stop and wonder, okay, well, what was meant to be understood by the ascension? And we have it right here, Acts 1. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So there you have it right there. As we mentioned earlier, our limited senses, they were able to see him bodily ascend, and then he was no longer in their sight. Then verse 10 says, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? 
the same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So it's very clear there. The two men are telling them, stop looking upwards in your limited kind of sense to be able to continue being able to see the Lord. He's no longer in your sight. He has left your sight. He has ascended into heaven in their ability to see. That is what they were limited to be able to see. Now, the incredible point here, Gary, is that very same body that Doubting Thomas touched, which was a physical body, is the very same body that was taken up before their very eyes. And then look at the connection there, Gary. Look at how Scripture is so supernaturally alive, where it says that same Christ who was taken up into heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go. Now, what does that mean there? That means he will also come down. He'll descend as well. Now, what does the book of Baruch tell you? What does the gospel of St. John say? They're very clear. It is only God who can ascend and descend by his own power. And I think that theology is really, really important, Gary. This is why at the earliest time in church history, we have the festival of the ascension being celebrated because they recognized this was a very important historical event. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't want to take you off track, William, but I would like to get your opinion on this. Now, yeah. the, the cloud in Scripture, sometimes it refers to a literal cloud, like a dust cloud or the clouds in the sky. But it can also refer to a theophany where heaven and earth meet, like, for example, in the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, in the cloud, uh, Christ is glorified and Moses and Elijah appears. Uh, so at the Ascension, uh, what do you take? Is it uh, a physical, literal cloud, or is it more of a theophany kind of cloud, or both? I, I believe it can be a mixture of both, Gary. I really do think it is a mixture of both. The reason being is for their minds to be able to captivate exactly what was occurring. I think it had to be a mixture of both. Now, there's no problem being able to say within our theology that it is a mix of both. And I think if you look at the writings of St. Augustine, now I need to dig into them a little more in depth, but from what I've read on this particular issue, I do believe that he did teach that it was a kind of mixture of both. And I think really the main point of what is being put forth there in the Gospels and in the book of Acts is the fact that this is a very glorious event. Either which way you look at it, this is glorious and this is unique, and it really, here's the other thing that I think was so important is that if you, and we'll look at it on the other side of the break, when you begin reading the early church fathers, they begin talking about, okay, well, uh, is, is, is this an actual cloud? Um, is Christ literally seated at the right hand of the Father? Uh, are these metaphors for something else in the sense of the right hand being so being a repre representation of being there seated in power rather than being seated in a physical chair and the cloud being representative of the incredible glory of God and the power of God. And I think all of that really is important to really ponder upon. And I think if we, if we look at the way clouds appear in the Old Testament, Shekinah, the glory cloud, and on and on, Gary, it's very clear this is representative of God's, not only God's power, but God's presence. And I think that's the most important thing we have to really focus upon. Yeah, 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 very good. Yeah, the other thing, too, is that last line in Acts 1. Uh, boy, that sounds a lot like something from the book of Daniel, where the Son of Man comes, you know, on uh, the clouds of heaven. Yep. You know, and those angels basically say, Hey, just like you saw Jesus go up to heaven, well, he's going to be coming down in the clouds, just like uh, Daniel prophesied. And that really is so important, Gary. Again, the un understanding the ascension of Christ is so proper to a proper Christology. because It is connected with the Son of Man theology we find in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, where we clearly have, in, in the night visions we're told there, a, one like a Son of Man is coming. Now, who is this figure? It's our incarnate Lord. He is with the Ancient of Days, God the Father. Now, why does God the Father appear as a, 
um, as an older man, as an ancient of days, not because he's literally an old man walking around in heaven, but in order for our finite minds to be able to understand what is occurring, this is an image of God the Father and our incarnate Lord as well. Our finite minds are able to understand and theologize much better. This is why these images appear for us. And this is why when we look at the theology of the ascension of the incarnation, it's so clearly connected with the Son of Man because the Son of Man, as you know, Gary, is our incarnate Lord. We're told that all nations will serve. Now that kind of servitude, that Greek latrua, latria, is a servitude given to God and God alone. Thus, the Son of Man who ascends to heaven and who descends is clearly almighty and incarnate God. And Gary, isn't it amazing the way all of this is connected? Because that Son of Man also gives us his body and blood in the Holy Eucharist. I mean, I've got to be very clear. Our incredible Catholic faith, all of this is so connected. The bodily resurrection, the bodily ascension, the Holy Eucharist connected with what does St. Ignatius say? That he craves the, the bread of God. That is what he craves. And he's talking about the Holy Eucharist there. All of this is connected with a proper Christology, Gary. And I've got to say, cling close to Holy Mother Church. You will get a clear picture of all of this within the Catholic faith. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what's the earliest mention in the, in the early church fathers who comments or speaks to the ascension? Yeah, so we find that in St. Augustine, Gary. Now, but here's the amazing thing. Even though we find it early on in St. Augustine, and people are going to say, they'll say, well, you know what, uh, you know, that's kind of late if you're going to be talking about early church fathers talking about it. No, it really isn't, because Augustine is talking about something that is already well established even before his time. So he's telling um, uh, talking about it being established well before his time, and he tells the audience, the readers, that it is of apostolic origin. This is really, really important. And then if you look at the writings of John Chrysostomos, St. Gregory of Nyssa, and many other areas, you clearly have mention of this. So this is very early on. This is being celebrated from apostolic times, as Augustine makes very clear. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're ch chatting with William Albrecht, patristicpillars.com, also William Albrecht channel on YouTube. We're talking about the ascension of our Lord. More to come right after this. You're listening in on Apologetics. Hey, Terry Rodriguez, I'm a monthly donor here in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm a retired Phoenix cop, and uh, I've met Jesse before, and um, I just want to tell you, you guys were on fire yesterday. I'm Terry and Jesse, so you guys are on fire. I went to bed thinking, uh, man, what an un unwinnable war, but when I got up, I listened to you guys. You know, you guys are doing good work, man, doing God's work, and keep doing it. I know it gets exhausting sometimes, but there's people out here that really need the inspiration and the evangelization that you guys are giving us. So my best to you, and I'm a, uh, Eddie Rodriguez, and I'm a monthly donor and proud of it. Logan, what has Virgin Most Powerful Radio done for you? A version most powerful radio, I gotta say, I've been a listener for about a year now, and it's really helped me grow closer to my faith and the fact that I'm listening and I'm getting unsugarcoated, clear, charity with clarity, Catholicism. And it has really helped me even, you know, grow so much deeper in my faith as a young man and discern the priesthood and have a love for Jesus Christ. And this is so seen on the Terry and Jesse show on Virgin Most Powerful, the unsugarcoated, clear truth of our Catholic faith that is so lacking today. It's almost like the Terry and Jesse show. It's the orange juice Catholicism that's filling things up. I just need to give my shout out, my praise. I'm just so appreciative. It just really helped me, and I know now people want to hear this. It inspires me to want to speak it, and it inspires me to even go as far as discerning the priesthood to think I should speak this. We need to stand up for our beautiful faith. This is the fun sugar coated beauty, and this is just what I've seen on the Terry and Jesse show. I encourage listeners to start donating and support this cause. It has just truly really impacted my life, and all I just want to give is some praise to it.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. We are chatting with William Albrecht of PatristicPillars.com and talking about our Lord's ascension into heaven. Uh, many ways, a forgotten feast of the church, and very important uh, apologetic aspect to it as well in terms of it uh, addressing things like the bodily resurrection and so on. And William, hey, since you're the patristic pillars guy, uh, why don't we dive into the early church fathers? Yeah, Gary, I really like uh, the fact that if you look at the early fathers, you have a very clear defense of what we read about in the Holy Scripture and, and that really is something that should really give people peace of mind. The fact that we've got these early, the earliest followers of the faith, many taught and trained by the apostles themselves or disciples and followers of the apostles. And if you look at the great St. Justin the Martyr, now his last name was not Martyr, but he, we don't know what his last name was. We only know that he was martyred. He died for the faith. Thus, he was given the, the name Justin the Martyr, the Martyr. And he's one of the greatest philosophers, early Christian apologists of all time. He wrote in the, in the in the 100s, and his apologies are just loaded with incredible theological material, Gary. And, and the one thing that really does blow me away is we're going to see how in this one tiny sentence in his Apologia 26, there is so much theology. He says, after Christ's ascension into heaven— the devils put forward certain men who said that they themselves were gods. Now, we might pause for a moment, and Gary and myself will say, oh, wow, great. Incredible early testimony to the bodily ascension of Christ into heaven. But there's more than just that there. Because within Justin Martyr, you also have Justin just so frustrated, dialoguing with pagans, Jews, and it gets to the point where he notes that, look, we recognize that there are pagan gods. Some of them sound so similar to our Lord and Savior Christ. Um, some of them may have, uh, you know, their, their similarities like virgin born, rose from the dead. These are incredible parallels. Today we hear about it all the time here. It's not, we get hit over the head with it all the time. But what does Justin Martyr say? He says, look, we're aware of that, but these come afterward. They are rather ripping off and copying the Christians, not the other way around. But today you would have, atheists would have you believe that the Christians copycatted the pagans. There is no evidence of that. And look at what Justin says. After the bodily ascensions, the devils. Now, I know that's powerful language, but he's talking about those that are imitating the faith. After the ascension, these devils put forth certain men who said they themselves were gods. So he begins to talk about pagan gods imitating the Christian faith. And Justin Martyr is a very, very early witness. Remember, he very frequently gets misrepresented. And people will say, well, Justin's, he's very clearly showing that the faith copycatted the pagans. No, he's very clear. It was the other way around. Our Lord's life was unique. Our Lord's death was unique. And our Lord's bodily resurrection and ascension were very unique. And I think that's a very powerful apologetic area. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, not only that, but like you said before, this idea that only God ascends to heaven yeah. It's interesting that it was pagan gods that tried to imitate the ascension. Yes, very interesting, Gary. Not only that, you you look at <clears throat> you look at the earliest writings 
And they're very different. And you realize that after, after the Christian faith, which was blowing up and exploding, pagans and Jews were leaving and converting because of the miraculous nature of our supernatural faith. And paganism needed to do damage control. They begin to mimic and copy these stories. You've got figures like Apoll 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 Apollonius of Tyana hmm. and all these other pagan gods that post-date the Christian faith that are clearly rip-offs. They do not predate it. Uh, they don't come at the same time they post-dated, many of them even second century or later. And that, Gary, is problematic for those that are attempting to say that the Christian faith was a copycat religion. It very clearly was not. Yeah, yeah. Excellent point. Excellent point. So, uh, okay, so we have Justin Martyr. Uh, is there any other uh, early church fathers that also speak to the Ascension? Now, Gary, I love talking about the great St. Irenaeus. Now, why is that? Well, we have a very clear apostolic connection in Irenaeus, right in the 100s. But who, who was he taught and trained by? Was taught and trained by St. Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna. Now, Polycarp of Smyrna was taught and trained by the apostle St. John. This is an amazing connection. Because in Irenaeus' fragments, he talks about how Polycarp knew the eyewitnesses, how he learned from St. John. So St. Irenaeus tells you, as he finished his gospel, Mark concluded, so then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. The ascension confirms what had been spoken by the prophet. The Lord said to my Lord, sit you on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Thus God, who was announced by the prophets, is truly one and the same as God, who is celebrated in the true gospel, whom we Christians worship and love with a whole heart as the maker of heaven and earth and of all things within it. That is in his against heresies, Gary, and really incredible theology, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Again, you know, the ascension being key to Christ's divinity. You know, it's so clear in Irenaeus of Lyon. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. And, and you know, before the show ends, I you know we have a few minutes left, but I've got to read this one. We've got a great Augustinian bishop. That was Bishop Fulgentius of Ruski, who in his commentary on the ascension says, not the Trinity, but Christ who is God above all things, who ascended to heaven in the flesh under the gaze of the disciples and who will come from heaven in the flesh. He who did not leave heaven when he took on flesh on earth and did not leave his own on earth when he ascended into heaven in the flesh because of his divinity. Indeed, he promised this saying, see, I am with you all days until the end of the earth. And then look at this. Look at how Fulgence connects the bodily ascension. Look at what he says. Uh, he says, indeed, he promises, saying, I am with you all days and the end of the earth. He is that God, therefore, who according to the prophecy of blessed Jeremiah is great and without limit, sublime and immense. He was talking about the bodily ascension and what does he do? quotes the words of Jeremiah that comes from Baruch chapter 3, right before the passage we read, which was clearly talked about in John chapter 3. Fulgence connecting the ascension with the prophetic words of the book of Baruch chapter 3. If you wanted any more evidence that the Deuter canon was being used in the early church to confirm doctrine, you got it right here. And I think that's incredible, considering Fulgence was no slouch. He was a very prominent bishop of the early church. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, you know, it's that passage from Baruch who yep. nails down Christ's divinity, you know, as a prophetic passage in the Old Testament. Yeah, it really is incredible. And we're, we're literally told this is prophetic. This is a prophecy. This is clearly he views it as the words of God right mixed in with everything else. Now, people that are tuning in, you have been given a wealth of Scripture in the Old Testament, New Testament, 
and the early church fathers, what I recommend to the audience, Gary, is they realize as we approach this amazing festival, this amazing feast day, to meditate upon the words of sacred scripture, meditate upon the words of, of the early church fathers, and to realize what we've been talking about today is a real event that occurred in time, that occurred in history, and a real event that had multiple eyewitnesses. And that is something that is truly incredible about our faith, isn't it, Gary? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, William, uh, it always, time always flies when you're on the show. So I want to hit pause right there because that's a beautiful ending. I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in your ministry. Uh, you have any debates coming up? Uh, I, we had Hugo Delgado on the other day. I guess you're going to be on his channel Friday. Yes, Hugo is incredible. Hugo is an amazing, amazing bilingual Catholic apologist. I am going to be on his channel very soon. In fact, now, now we have new developments. We're going to do multiple shows on Purgatory in Spanish and on the Immaculate Conception. And people, you're going to want to tune in because I'm going to bring Father Coppice for a future show with me. We're going to join Ugo and we're going to talk about Catholic teaching. Father Coppice, as people know, knows a ton of languages. I don't know how he remembers them all. I really don't <laughs> know how, but he's truly incredible aside from being an amazing scholar. He's an incredible linguist. We're really thrilled about that. I'm thrilled about future debates I've got coming up, uh, multiple debates on Pints with Aquinas over there with Matt Frad, multiple ones on Reason and Theology, a few in person as well. Well, I'll be traveling. I'll announce those once the details have been laid out. But a lot of really fun stuff going on, Gary, and I'm thrilled to be able to announce that to, to the audience here on Hands on Apologetics because there's a lot of great stuff going on in the Catholic world, and I'm just really happy about it. And I want to point people to our channel, The Apocrypha Apocalypse. If they have not gone over there and subbed yet, they've got to do that because we've got a lot of incredible material coming out. And we're dealing with the nitty-gritty, the best arguments in theology you can think about when it comes to the Deuterocanon. That is what I think is very unique. It's a very niche channel, but it's a channel that will really feed you spiritually. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and of course, patristicpillars.com. You're also on Facebook, which I, uh, that's a great way to know, you know, up to the minute uh, details, because like, you are one of, next to Steve Ray, I think you're probably one of the busiest apologists I know. And, and that says a lot, because Steve is incredibly, incredibly busy. He sure is, Gary, but I've had a blast, and I look forward to being back with you all in the future. Awesome. Well, William, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Thank you, Brad. Uh, that is Will, William Albrecht, patristicpillars.com. Check it out, folks. Also, William Albrecht on YouTube. Man, as always, the hour just flew. Coming up next, High Impact Catholic Talk, coming at you with the Terry and Jesse Show. Until next time, I'm Gary Machuda, and God willing, we'll be back again tomorrow. Do this thing we call hands on. Bye bye, everybody.